Hi folks, Florida Man here, bringing you my Floridian Diplomacy thoughts on a game organized by some folks on Discord and played on Backstabber. This game was called Scorched Earth, and several players from my own Discord server were recruited to join it. I will have both my own perspective and some notes from the English point of view here, as well as some closing thoughts from both England and Germany. It's not enough for a full-blown separate perspective from either of them, but I will make a note of it when I'm referring to those other players' thoughts. I was assigned to play as Turkey. I usually find Turkey a fairly tolerable power to play, so I looked forward to the game. As we began 1901 negotiations, I had a reasonably interesting set of exchanges. Russia and I both lied to each other and said we would keep out of the Black Sea. Austria and I were more frank with each other, and we agreed that we would combine forces against the Russians. Austria agreed that although he wasn't willing to go for Galicia, which he and Russia had agreed to DMZ, he would take Romania in spring 1901. The honesty was something I appreciated, and it gave me a reason to take a gamble on Austria and open to Armenia. Austria was promising to work with me against both Russia and Italy here, and I felt a decent likelihood he might actually keep his agreements. Unfortunately, there was a bit of a red flag. One of the first powers I communicated with, Italy, never responded to my initial message. When spring 1901 orders process, Russia and I bounce in the Black Sea, as expected really, even though we both lied. I landed in Armenia and Bulgaria, and Austria opened to Albania, Romania, and Budapest, a strong opening for Austria, despite the fact that he had no way of knowing if the silent Italy was going to attack him. Russia bounced me in the Black Sea, tried to move Moscow to Sevastopol, and pulled Warsaw into Ukraine. A very ineffective opening on this occasion because it relied on me falling for Russia's deception. To the west, Germany made a fairly aggressive opening, moving into Burgundy and Denmark to have options to attack both France and Russia immediately. France tried to open for maximum growth, moving so he could take Spain, Portugal, and Belgium if he made good diplomatic decisions, and England opened north, probably the most typical English opening, leaving open the option of a convoy to Norway. Following spring moves, I communicated with England and encouraged this possible convoy because it was suddenly obvious that Russia would be my first enemy. Looking to other areas of the map, France expressed great annoyance that Germany had moved into Burgundy, France wanted to know if I planned to keep working against Russia, and I told him truthfully that I did. France and I discussed a split of Italy and Tunis, as well as some form of accommodation with Austria. My plan was that I would either fight France and get more than half of the traditional Italian centers that we had agreed to, or I would keep to my agreement with France and turn on Austria, depending on how things shook out between me and France, and how things worked out in the east. Looking to the south, though, seeing that Italy had not moved, as well as apparently never responding to anyone's messages, it was a pretty big bummer for the whole board, and we began discussing a possible reboot of the game with a new player in that slot. The Russian player threatened to quit if we didn't restart with a replacement player. I suggested we put it to a vote, and everyone gave their vote. Ultimately, only two powers wanted to start over, Austria and Russia, so we decided to continue. Russia, however, did not respect the results of the vote, and said he would submit hold orders for the rest of the game if we didn't do what he wanted anyway. My response was that if the game restarted, I wanted to play without Russia who I said was acting like a child. In fall 1901, Austria complied with the terms of our deal and supported me into Sevastopol. Although this failed to land, our attack, and the fact that Austria already had Romania, resulted in Russia wasting all his moves and not gaining any centers. In the build phase, Austria furthered our plan by getting two armies and a fleet to advance against Italy and Russia simultaneously and prevent France from monopolizing the Italian centers. In spring 1902, Austria and I agreed to the same offensive strategy as last season, except that I could now guarantee the Black Sea, and Austria would simultaneously send Budapest into Galicia. Russia would have to choose between defending the Black Sea and defending Galicia. We also agreed that Austria would give me Greece and go for Tunisia. At the same time, Germany messaged me indicating he wanted to participate in the partition of Russia. He claimed Russia had a bad personality. He also said he would be interested in working with me against Austria once Russia was gone. After spring orders processed, Austria and I got into the Black Sea and Galicia successfully. Unfortunately for Germany, this was where he got attacked by France and England unexpectedly. I guess it was unexpected, because he seemed surprised enough for both of us. Our communication kind of dried up after that, because I think Germany's future was sort of dried up at that point. In fall 1902, Austria and I had mild disagreements about tactics going forward, I wanted him to focus on guaranteeing that I would get Sevastopol as soon as possible, because I was fairly certain Russia had a grudge against me, and would defend against me as fiercely as he could, 
and Austria wanted to reward Germany for coming east to join us against Russia by supporting him into Warsaw. I ultimately accepted it, but the decision annoyed me. Germany had no particular investment in our alliance, so why would I care if he gets Warsaw this year or next? If the West turns against him, he'll never even be of help to us on other fronts, and this will wind up feeling like a wasted season. Since Austria had passed on Greece, though, I could hardly complain to him. From England's perspective, this is what happened in 1902. Through press, he worked out that nobody liked Russia, so after Russia offered him support into Sweden, England decided it would be good to repay him with support into German supply centers, which would also serve to slow down the otherwise rapid demise of Russia. Back to the Turkish perspective, in the build phase, Russia worked on separating me from Austria with what I would consider a signature blend of cajoling and insulting. I ignored him at that point. In spring 1903, Austria agreed to devote two of his units to ensuring I would take Sevastopol. This would guarantee I gained the center, albeit a little late. Austria also proposed he would leave the Ionian open so I could move in there and begin helping him with our naval expansion against France. Russia, meanwhile, followed up on the message I'd ignored with more cajoling, basically begging to Janissary for me. I began thinking more seriously about it. If Russia was as good as his word and began ordering his units to meet my demands, I could quickly take over the whole east and be invading the south of France before the west was fully settled. When orders processed, we see that I continued to work with Austria. I successfully moved into Sevastopol and Ionian Sea, positioning to be able to support Austria against France or take some of Italy. Russia at the time supported himself into Warsaw, taking himself completely out of position to be able to try and retake Sevastopol. In the west, England and France continued to fight with Germany, while France moved its two fleets toward the clear goal of taking Tunis. For fall 1903, I requested that Austria support me into Naples, and I suggested we DMZ some of our shared border regions, namely Greece and Serbia, with an eye toward doing the same for Bulgaria and Romania soon. Austria seemed agreeable to this, although it was hard to believe he was actually going to do everything I had asked for. It seemed a little bit too generous to be believed, as well as a little too trusting, and I had heard from France at this time that Austria had also promised to turn Tunis over to him, which was frankly a bizarre promise and a very bad move, if true, since Tunis is a critical stalemate line center that Austria and I should never let go of. I thought that Austria must at least be lying to one of the two of us, since he couldn't afford to be this generous with us both, and it wouldn't even make sense to try to stay on both of our good sides from my perspective. He would have no choice but to fight one or the other of us sometime very soon. At this point, I began conspiring furiously with Russia, although I think he likewise found it difficult to believe I would actually turn on Austria, vacate Sevastopol, and restore Russian relevance in the game, essentially for nothing more than a promise of his future allegiance. We will see how much that promise was worth, by the way. When fall orders processed, I pulled off what Russia referred to in the public press as a top five stab. I successfully walked into the undefended Serbia and underdefended Romania, and accepted Austrian support into Naples at the same time. For some reason, Austria actually followed through on the promises he'd made to both me and France. It was a bad decision because it gave ground to France even though his forces were inferior to ours in numbers. Looking to what happened in the West, France wouldn't have even had any builds if Austria hadn't given up Tunis this season. Although the Anglo-French alliance pushed Germany back, England and Russia were the only beneficiaries from that since England took Holland and supported Russia into Kiel. Looking east, Russia also continued to hold on to Warsaw because I didn't tap Moscow and cut Russian support for Warsaw holding. After the fall, I felt bad about the stab and I told Austria so. I wasn't trying to repair relations exactly, but I wanted to keep them less bitter than they could be. Something told me that I might need this player again if my stab plans didn't come to the fullest possible fruition after this. And at the same time, Russia and I had disagreements about the builds. I was happy with his proposal to build a St. Pete North Coast fleet. I was less happy that he pushed very strongly, some would say demanded, that I build two fleets. I pointed out that I had intelligence that Austria would be destroying his units in the Italian region and keeping his homeland defense armies, while France was a tiny naval power at this moment and didn't have many builds coming. So I would need the two armies and one fleet to counter both of them effectively. Russia took this idea as a declaration of war and a statement that France was my primary ally while Russia would become my target. At least that's what he said. It's hard to believe he actually meant it, but those were the manipulative words that he expressed. When the build orders processed, we see that France accurately conveyed what Austria was going to do, while Russia had decided, according to him based on my statements, that he should build armies and prepare to fight me instead of England or Germany. He tried to justify this as being some sort of self-defense, but since that was pure BS, I feel no need to give his reasoning more time in my video than that. By spring 1904, 
I was communicating to Austria that picking the Russian over him had been a bad mistake, that Russia was very untrustworthy, and that I would happily support him into the Russian home centers if he would pardon the knife I'd stuck in his back. I promised to support Austria in Sevastopol, and I made my initial proposals for our naval defense against France. When orders process, you see I followed through on my promise to Austria, even though he didn't accept my support, ultimately. Frankly, I figured what's the worst that could happen. My position isn't going to collapse even if Austria and Russia both attack me, and France will probably join me in fighting Austria. As you can see, France positioned to do something other than helping me. He moved into Ionian Sea and positioned to go after all of Italy, including both my and Austria's centers there. Austria had fully abandoned Italy to fight me, seemingly ready to throw everything away so he could avenge himself against me. An understandable decision, if not necessarily a very successful one. We can see he took one center off me this season, and that was only possible because I was trying to work with him rather than attack him. If I had simply supported Romania into Budapest this season, I would have taken that center and left Austria trying to figure out how to recapture it without losing the center he'd just gained. Russia made neutral self-defense orders, while Germany went to Silesia for some reason, abandoning his homeland to France and Russia. England began putting more boots on the ground by convoying into Denmark. Looking to the fall map, you can see that this continues to go rather badly for Austria. He's not really well equipped to fight me and at the same time sort of quasi defend what he has left in Italy from France and he's flailing and not really making much progress. He does successfully get from Romania into Serbia but the result of that is that now I have Romania again. So again he only took one single dot off of me and at the same time I got Rome from him so the only net winner of us fighting is France. In the north England continues to make progress. The unit that he had just landed on Denmark gets into Kiel now, and he is just making a lot of moves. He takes Belgium from France, so it's starting to seem like either there's been some reallocation of resources agreed to there, or possibly France is getting pushed around or is in the process of being stabbed. I don't really think that England would stab France for one dot, but you never know. On the other hand, the Austro-German coalition of sorts does have a victory in that Germany retakes Warsaw, although this is without Austrian support because Austria is too preoccupied with fighting me. Even though Russia is now supporting Austria, it's not really going any better for them. Following these disappointing but not terribly surprising fall moves, I told Austria I understood why he had attacked me, but I was genuinely trying to work with him now, Russia was only trying to recover his position, and France would take advantage of our division to grow further at Austria's expense. Austria ultimately came around to working together again, but he suggested a condition where he would only build armies and I would only build fleets. Frankly, I was somewhat dismissive of this condition, since we were already backed into a corner, and while it might make sense for us to build that way right now, given where our units and enemies were, I also thought an Austrian fleet right now, if it was possible to build one, would have been really handy. Ultimately, Austria and I agreed to combine forces again. I warned him that if he attacked me again, I would help France to take over Austria, and Austria assured me he would not be the one to break the peace we had made. In the build phase, we can see France acquired a Brest fleet and a Paris army, which was a little odd for the present situation, but might make sense if he was considering turning on England. England, however, built fleets in Liverpool and London, a poisonous combination for France if France did start a fight. Russia destroyed his unit in Berlin, while Germany destroyed his unit in Silesia, leaving Berlin open to France or England to occupy next. After builds had been adjudicated, my concern was how Austria and I could build trust with our next moves so that we wouldn't be overly cautious and defensive with each other going forward. I figured that would be fatal to our defensive efforts. For spring moves, Austria suggested I could evacuate Albania and Bulgaria to minimize my presence on his borders, and then he would feel comfortable DMZing Serbia. He also suggested we try an alliance with Russia. But given how Russia had behaved so far, and the fact that both England and Russia had made it obvious that Russia was in the English pocket, I felt it was highly unlikely Russia would attempt to work with us constructively at all, so I quickly vetoed that idea. I told Austria that I was pretty sure if we started to push France back successfully, England would turn on France. Turning England and France against each other was all we really needed to do. In the spring, you see England actually seems to move everything towards France. He moves fleets into North Atlantic Ocean, Irish Sea, and the Channel, and he also destroys the French unit in Ruhr. 
This is the moment of the English stab against France, as far as I'm concerned, and it comes much sooner than I expected. France is still struggling with us in the south, and he's not really close to actually making real progress. He's taken a couple of centers, but he's going to have trouble holding them, and what he needs to do is to try and turtle up in his homeland, or Tunis, if he wants any prospect of lasting through this game. Russia successfully retakes Warsaw, which is his last bit of real success in this game. Austria and I have a season of repositioning to go after Russia and France instead of each other. Planning fall 1905 moves, Austria agreed to tap Moscow from Ukraine so I could guarantee Sevastopol. We also decided to attack Tunis, tap Naples, and support Budapest into Galicia. Looking at what happens in the adjudication, you can see Austria and I did exactly what we had agreed to. Trust has been reconstructed, and our teamwork is moving like a Swiss watch. I retook Sevastopol and Tunis, and Austria and I also surrounded the Italian peninsula. France is following up strategic error with tactical error by splitting his forces, focusing on the south over his homeland, and leaving Iberia empty. Russia loses St. Pete to Germany, who is supported in by England, and loses Berlin to France, who walks in unsupported because Russia simply didn't enter orders this season. Although the tactical side of our plans had been successful, the 1905 builds brought bad news. I had to tell Austria that France was not going to be pulling back from the shared border region to focus on England, because France didn't believe he could win against England. Or at least that was the French excuse in messages to me. I can't be sure if that line of reasoning is really what motivated France, or if England somehow had him convinced that France could still share in the draw even while he was now just acting as an English puppet. I think that really, the task of trying to fight England was too daunting for France to contemplate, so he allowed England to bully him into being a Janissary. The impression I have of France at this point is of someone who's given up, who's ready to roll over and play dead. The actual build orders were a surprising Russian destroy in Moscow, an unsurprising English army in London that could be convoyed almost anywhere on the map, and an outright dumb French fleet in Marseille, which showed he was doubling down on the failing strategy of fighting in the south while being slowly killed in the north. 1905 from the English perspective. Russia had basically regained full strength according to England. This made England nervous to follow through on supporting Russia into Munich, as a Russian army in Berlin could easily work with France to kick England out of the continent. In retrospect, he feels he was being too paranoid here, but that was what drove the decision-making. Back to the Turkish perspective, in spring 1906, we agreed to a strategy of retaking all of Italy, attacking Moscow, and positioning to try and snatch an occupied center from near the stalemate line. When orders process, you can see that in material terms, we continue to succeed. We retake all of Italy, we take Moscow, and we begin taking out stalemate line positions. Unfortunately, France continued to be an enemy, and retook Tunis this season. I tried to persuade him that he should just destroy the units we dislodged on the Italian peninsula, and rebuild wherever he could to defend his homeland, but France wasn't really listening. If I wanted him to fight England, he made clear he wanted me to tell him exactly how to win that fight. He was abdicating the responsibility for thinking through his own tactics, in other words. It was very frustrating, because the fight was winnable, and we were willing to help him, but it wasn't as though I could give him some kind of a five-step plan. The problem he really had was an unwillingness to do things for himself, even though he would benefit from them. This season, we see England occupying Berlin, Brest, and Picardy, by the way. In fall 1906, Austria was beginning to lose hope, so my main task was trying to keep his spirits up. He ultimately had a conversation with France, where Austria tried offering him support into Munich as a way of hopefully creating an incentive for France to act in coordination with us, and I think that was a source of a little new hope for him. When order is processed, we see that remarkably, without even giving Brest or Berlin back, England got France to convoy his Picardy unit all the way to Tuscany so that England could take part in the battle for Italy. It's at this point that it begins to look like France might actually be trying to help England solo, rather than trying to be included in a draw with England. If that's the case, we're just waiting to die now, because they already have Tunis, and enough fleets in the area that I have no real prospect of retaking it, so the only question is how long it will take them to transfer the necessary centers from France to England. In the builds, Austria gets more armies while I get a new fleet. We're not giving up as long as we have units to fight with, as far as I'm concerned. In spring 1907, I begin basically doing all of the planning for our moves. Austria didn't always do exactly what I asked him to do, but he stopped responding to messages for a while and he mostly ordered in accordance with what I said. I think he was sick of the game, so he decided to just follow my lead and let me do most of the thinking about it. 
I can't say I've never been there myself. You can see the first thing we do is retake Warsaw, and we also take Tyrolia, although unfortunately we failed to hold on to Bohemia. And these little failures are adding up to big problems, because the German centers are England's big vulnerability right now, and we could take them if we got enough units near them, because England hasn't adequately reinforced that region yet. In Italy, you see there's a big mess, but what it comes down to is Austria and I succeeding in preventing any movement this season. In the fall, we lose Rome, but the loss of the center doesn't really worsen our position. In the build phase, Germany finally disappears. Looking to spring 1908, you see we retake Rome, and we are again trying to surround the sparsely defended former German centers. England convoys onto France. The situation is not good. If France wants to, he can give England the solo almost any time by simply not defending Tunis and the other French centers. For the English perspective on 1906 to 1908, England recommends you check out his own video on this game on his YouTube channel, which I've linked in the description of this video. He specifically promises more of the details and why of the Anglo-French relationship, though he notes here that they had sort of made up and were pushing to make France a Mediterranean power, though he suspected that Austria-Turkey picking the seemingly perfect moves to counter theirs meant that France was feeding information to the enemy to create a stalemate position. And I must interject from my own perspective that France never fed us any information. My plans were just formulated through my own experience. Once you have a few hundred games of diplomacy under your belt, your tactics get pretty good. Returning to England's perspective, he says that regarding 1908 to the end game, he simulated a million different futures, and in only one of those would he get the solo. France and Russia would have to let him. Back to the Turkish perspective, I must note that unfortunately, in spring 1909, Austria has one of his most important deviations from the battle plans I've been laying out of the game so far. I had requested support to take Piedmont, and Austria didn't give it, instead opting to double support Trieste into Tyrolia, which turned out to not be necessary. In practice, this meant that we had no opportunity to try to contest Marseille if England wanted to take it. In short, if France isn't trying to stop England actively, England can win this game right now. Fall 1909 brought a new message from Austria, pleasantly surprising me. It was brief, just suggesting a couple of moves, and the difference wasn't a big one from what I had already proposed, but it was nice to know that he was still interested enough in preventing the solo to send a message in this late stage. Unfortunately, Fall 1909 is the final season. When orders have processed, England reigns supreme. If only we had made the move into Piedmont last season, it would have destroyed the army that England used to take Marseille, and perhaps we could have stopped England from taking over the world. Then again, probably not. If a group of powers who have 18 centers or more between them wants to give one of them the solo, they'll almost always succeed. The bigger question for me is why. England's final thoughts were that there was no way he would have won this game without the help of both France and Russia to make it happen. To them, he is grateful. Germany had some final thoughts he wished to share too. He said he should have been either more or less aggressive with France, going for Marseille instead of Belgium, for example, and that he shouldn't have trusted England. The final Turkish thoughts. England is correct that he wouldn't have won without France's willing acquiescence. Frankly, I don't think Russia's help made much difference either way, since he couldn't convey any centers to England that were across the stalemate line, nor could he influence what happened in the struggle for Tunis, or even the events in the middle of the map when Austria and I were hoping to acquire Munich. Russia gleefully handing over St. Petersburg made very little difference to the endgame, since that center would have fallen to England eventually anyway, even if Austria and I had worked with Russia to try and keep him in control of it. Far more important was the behavior of France. Unfortunately, France was so apparently uninterested in participating in the draw, or even surviving the game, that he easily gave everything up to England, despite my repeated efforts to persuade him to defend himself. Even as the English solo drew closer and more inevitable, France continued to prefer fighting with me and Austria and leaving his centers open to England over possibly being in the winner's circle. I can't precisely explain it, except to say that this was one of those many games when the power of personality wins out over everything else. France must have liked or trusted England so much, or disliked me and Austria so intensely that he was happy to deliver the solo. I hope you liked this Florida Man Diplomacy production. If so, the best way to quickly express it is by pushing the subscribe button and watching more videos. We also like it when people like and comment. I would also like to thank the individuals named in the credits here because they help fuel this channel's growth through contributions on Patreon or by translating the videos into other languages. You too can join the Alligator Army by becoming one of my patrons.
Until next time, Florida Man, out.